Welcome to Out of the Trenches, where I, Indy Nidell, sit here in the Chair of Wisdom and answer your questions about the First World War. Roger Fingus has a question. Why was the top German medal called, of all things, the Pour le Merit? That's okay, yeah. Now, I guess it could be confusing that the highest German award for merit, or Tapferkeit, has a French name. Well, the award has its origins back in the 18th century, and it was founded in 1740 by Frederick II of Prussia. France and Prussia were already in conflict with each other then, but Frederick and the higher Prussian society were still very much Francophiles, admiring the French ideals of the Enlightenment, particularly Voltaire. And speaking French was a sign of high culture. And you can think of it as comparable to what is nowadays the universal use of English. French was the international language spoken at the courts as far as St. Petersburg and was the official language of international diplomacy. Fun Great War fact, the declaration of war from Austria-Hungary to Serbia was written in French. Um, well, the award. Okay, at first the award was open to well, technically anyone. Uh, Voltaire got one. Uh, and for a short time, Friedrich Wilhelm III restricted it in 1810 to only military personnel and added a higher version of the medal with gilded oak leaves on top of the cross, which traditionally indicates a great military feat. So to be awarded the Pour le Marie, you basically had to I don't know, capture a fortress, destroy an army, or do something similarly impressive. So it was naturally reserved for high-ranking officers and generals. The Paul Le Marites given out during the Great War were mostly for high ranks, like, like for example, guys like Ludendorff or uh, Hindenburg or Mackensen for successes on the Eastern Front. Uh, von Houtier and Bruckmüller got theirs in the spring of 1918. Um, but it was also opened up for other branches, uh, especially for the Air Force, like for Bolke or for both von Richter funds. Its nickname, the Blue Max, actually stems from awarding it to Max Immelmann, Germany's first flying ace. Um, for the Army and the Navy, U-boat commanders like De La Perriere or Walter Schwieger, as well as soldiers like, like Rommel or Ernst Jünger, uh, all who were in the lower officer ranks, like Leutnant or Oberleutnant, like most other medals, the Pour Le Marit had to be displayed on the uniform at all time. Uh, its military bestowal would cease after the abdication of the Kaiser, the monarchy, in 1918. And Ernst Jünger is actually the last holding member until his death in 1998. Uh, Mr. Dr. Genius, okay, Mr. Dr. Genius has unrelated question. <laughs> unrelated to what? Never mind, I'm already liking this one. Okay. Uh, Persia was officially neutral, but both the Entente and the Central Powers were fighting its territory anyway. So who invaded Persia first? Well, uh, right before the war, the Germans tried to economically get their foot in the door by building the Berlin-Baghdad Railway. But the first military invasion of Persia, or let's say Mesopotamia for broader context, okay, was by the British in what is now southern Iraq. In November 1914, Indian troops were pushing towards Basra with two goals in mind. The short-term goal was to secure the oil fields in southwestern Persia and its supply line in the Persian Gulf. The long-term goal was to establish the landline from India, Baghdad, Egypt. And the Ottoman forces uh, resisting them, opposing them, were way too weak to repulse the offensive at first, mostly small policing or border forces. But the siege of Kut el Amara in 1916, well in late 1915, did put a stop to the British advance at the time. However, the Ottomans, although victorious, were not strong enough to really use that success and asked the Germans to intervene and send troops to Mesopotamia. For the most part, their actions were confined to patrolling the Euphrates and Tigris rivers in small cannon boats, being a nuisance to the British by threatening their supply routes and their flanks. As for Persia proper, long story short, uh, there was a British zone of influence in the south, where they were securing, you know, the oil supplies. There was a neutral zone in the center, and in the north was a zone of Russian influence. Now, these zones would actually interlap, overlap and intercross because it was a complicated situation. Like in the center, you had Swedish gendarmerie uh, sort of keeping things under control. But the Germans actually sent people to the neutral 
zone uh, of Persia. Uh, this was undercover, and it wasn't a lot of people, but they were sent there to try to incite revolt among the local Sunni tribes against the mostly Shia, I guess, ruling class, you'd call it. Uh, this failed, um, but there were a lot of diplomatic and political machinations, particularly in the neutral zone, but all over Persia throughout the war. Um, I know we mentioned Tehran once or twice in the Dunster Force special. Uh, he was in communication with the British in, in Tehran, so it was a... You're going to have to look it up for yourself, but it was a real, real zone of complicated maneuvers. And there was... Uh, there was armed movement there. I know the Russians actually sent men down as far as Kerman Shah several, several times during the war. Um, we never really mentioned it because it was never really relevant to any of the major action during the weeks we were talking about. Hope that helps. Gavronito44 writes, uh, First I have to say, love the show guys. Cool. You did an amazing job. I've been watching all your episodes. Would you be so kind and talk about Polish legions in France or in Russia? How Polish soldiers were treated in the Prussian or Austro-Hungarian army, okay? They fought in every front, in every army, in every front. There's a lot to talk about. Greetings from Krakow. Well, okay, greetings from Berlin. Well, since the beginning of the war in 1914, Polish politicians were advocating in Vienna for Polish detachments within the Austro-Hungarian army. They thought they'd get support for Polish autonomy this way. Austria-Hungary, realizing that the Polish people on the Russian border were a potentially swaying factor in that area, agreed to create two Polish legions of infantry and cavalry regiments, one near Lemberg, one at Krakow. The same time, though, you had other paramilitary groups that wanted to take things into their own hands, since now the opportunity had kind of arisen. Josef Pilsudski rallied armed men around him and tried to start a revolt against the Russians, like the Seven Lancers of Berlina, who attacked Russian supply lines behind the front but most Russian citizens stayed loyal to the Tsar. The Polish legions faced the same struggle. Some soldiers wanted to stay loyal to their respective empires. Others would only fight for Polish independence. So there was already a split, um, but they were sent against Warsaw, uh, the Battle of Limanova, the Carpathians, the Brusilov Offensive, seeing pretty heavy fighting and regularly withstanding overwhelming Russian forces. But after the Germans took command of the Eastern Front forces in general, the Polish legions, especially Pilsudski, well, they expressed doubt. See, like not only did he not want his forces under German control, who were well known for their plans of not giving Poland real independence, but he also felt that victory lay with the Entente, and like many others, refused to take an oath of loyalty to the German Empire, with this consequently led to the disbanding of the legions. Now, with the entry of the Americans into the war, Polish exiles and Polish Americans banded together into the so-called Blue Army, or the Haller Army, under Josef Haller, around 25 to 35,000 strong, and they were sent to fight the Central Powers in France. This army functioned as the official army of Poland during the war, though outfitted by France, until after the war, uh, when it could become part of the actual Polish army. And something completely different here. Okay, guys, you remember the time, oh, like four years ago, when we had only just started the channel? Well, it was back then when Mediacraft, the YouTube network that initially financed this channel, forced other larger creators within the network to promote our show to make our start easier. And now, in 2018, where we are one of the big channels, we are getting forced to do the same. So, some of our colleagues started a channel called Blockchain Central, and it's about cryptocurrency. You can check it out right here if you're into the topic. Or don't, I mean, you know, that's also cool. See you next time.